Okay. So my name is Jennifer Stroh, and I'm the Events and Outreach Manager at the Land Trust for Santa Barbara County. Our online Lunch and Learn series includes a variety of presentations and workshops scheduled on the third Wednesday of every month from 12.30 to 1.30 p.m. The meetings are free and open to the public, and all are welcome. Land Trust is a nonprofit organization, 501c3. Our conservation work spans the entire county of Santa Barbara, and we've been conserving land since 1985. The Land Trust has helped to conserve more than 30,000 acres of wildlife habitat, recreational space, farm and ranch land, land and open visas for all to enjoy. Our mission is to conserve lands throughout the county that nourish people and nature, including farms and ranches, healthy habitat for wildlife and plants, beautiful trails and open spaces that provide recreational gateways that are accessible to all. Some of our properties include the Arroyo Hondo Preserve on the Gaviota Coast, which we'll, you'll hear a little bit more about today. Um, we helped with the conservation of the Sedgwick Reserve in the San Inez Valley, which is part of the UC Natural Reserve System, the Coronado Butterfly Preserve in Goleta, the Carpentria Salt Marsh, and several ranches on the Gaviota Coast, as well as farm and ranch land in Lompoc and areas headed to Santa Maria. Uh, our most recent conservation success, just a, about a week or two ago, was about a thousand acres in Lompoc near the Dangerman Preserve called the Halama Canyon Ranch. Um, we are growing. We, we've increased our membership from 750 people to about 1,000 in the past couple of years. And we have a robust volunteer board of trustees and a staff of 11. I'd like to introduce real quick another staff member who's here. Uh, Katie Sabo is one of our newer staff members, our communications um, coordinator. and. We have another person here too um, who's helping to coordinate our hiking program, Anne Lippincott. Um, I'll just give a quick shout out for Anne. Oh, there you are. Good. Hi. <laughs> and um, so we all work closely together and make a lot of stuff happen. A small, small group of people, pretty productive staff and volunteers. Um, the Land Trust really appreciates our members though. And if you'd like to become a member or make a donation, I will put um, some links in the chat box that are available for you. And uh, you can also visit our website if you'd like to do that. Um, I'd now like to introduce our featured speaker, a local naturalist, a woman who has been working for the Land Trust for about 10 years and serves as the education coordinator for the Arroyo Hondo Preserve. Her name is Sally Isaacson. Sally's famous for her work at the Arroyo Hondo Preserve where she hosts stream ecology workshops for school children and coordinates the environmental education program with volunteer docents. She also manages the habitat restoration and trail maintenance work days. At heart, Sally is a botanist and educator. She worked at the Santa Barbara Botanic Garden for 20 years and is a former director of education there. She has an MA in botany and several teaching credentials. She's taught at Allen Hancock College in public schools and occasionally teaches classes for the Santa Barbara Botanic Garden. Sally enjoys writing and nature photography and writes occasional articles for local publications. For many years, she and her husband ran a herd of beef cattle on their family ranch, which is protected by a conservation easement and located near Lompoc. Currently, she has a small cow herd, a horse, and other animals on her own little ranch. Sally, thank you for treating us to a presentation about wildflowers today, and I will now turn the meeting over to you. And unmute you. <laughs> Okay, can you hear me? Yes, great. great. Okay, welcome everybody from the United States and Ireland. Woohoo! <laughs> um, in Ireland, it's about 8.30 in the evening. I, I'm glad you weren't asleep. 
<laughs> and welcome to our volunteers and other friends of the Land Trust who are out there. I did look through and see some of your names, but not your faces. Um, I'm going to give a show on our local wildflowers of the Santa Barbara region. And these pictures were taken over at least the last 10 or 15 years. This spring has been a really poor wildflower spring because the area that you're looking at right now only had about three inches of rain. And the area where I live only had about 12 instead of about 20 inches of rain. And so we really haven't had good flowers. So it's a good thing these are Zoom flowers. We'll do virtual flower hunting and um anyway welcome and i'm going to go on and at the end we'll have some time for questions and jennifer will come back and tell us about other programs of the land trust so this is the carrizo plain which is to the east it's on that sort of desert fringe and in a good year it'll have amazing wildflower displays oops uh oh what's going on why isn't it? Why can't it advance? Oh, there we go. All right. Um, many of you know that Santa Barbara County lies in a botanical sort of area called the California Floristic Province. And this is an area that's been identified as one of the world's 35 biodiversity hotspots. And that means all those red areas are hot spots and where we're around here. And we have just tons and tons of species of native plants and tons and tons of species of wildlife. And um, you will see a lot, but you won't see even a small portion of the number of species we have. I'm, I grew up as a botanist. My teacher is there, Paul Dowding. Um, from Ireland, and um, but I've I've since become a, a sort of bird and mammal and reptile enthusiast. So you'll see a few animals in here too. Okay, um, we the last time I looked, um, we thought we had about five thousand species of plants in California. And a great portion of those are in our county of Santa Barbara. Things that contribute to botanical diversity are listed here. Moisture, temperature, frost versus no frost. That's a big thing in our area. I can grow apples and plums and peaches and down the road about five miles, they can grow avocados and lemons. Um, a big variable here is the frequency of wildfires. We're in a big wildfire area, unfortunately. Soil type is a big variable, and the soils that develop from our many rock types are quite varied. The distance from the ocean, and that includes the effect of summer fog during our dry summer season. The distance from the ocean is very important. The slope aspect, whether an area is north facing or south facing is important as is elevation. And another important factor is our very strange Mediterranean climate, strange on a world basis, where we have hot, dry summers and cooler, moist winters. You don't really get a great growing season for plants where you have moisture and warmth at the same time as you might in Ireland, for example. Um, one of our botanists in Santa Barbara County um, bow to a former botanist, Cliff Smith, who wrote The Flora of the Santa Barbara Region. And he is sadly, he's passed on, but he left us a great legacy and he classified our plant communities, as you see here, a huge number of different types of plant communities. And in each of these, we can find a special array of wildflowers. And um, also each species has evolved so that it is very well adapted to its particular environment. For example, we have 
tons and tons of lupin species. We have tons and tons of oak species and many other plants in California, huge diversity. Um, I'm going to begin by talking about just a few of our local plant communities and then show you wild, wildflowers that you might find in each of these. Oak woodlands, we have beautiful oak woodlands. We have many species of oaks and each, each has different um, associated flora, different habitats with, with the oaks. Um, for example, in the shade of our oak trees, we sometimes find this beautiful thing. It's a mariposa lily called a fairy lantern. We also have hummingbird sage, a salvia, which the hummingbirds are attracted to because they can see red and magenta really well. But see the, the little bird has not only a long beak, it also has a long tongue. It's looking for nectar and it's getting hit on the head by the stamens. So then the pollen is brought to the next flower. Um, another couple in the shade are the fiesta flower and the wood mint, beautiful plants. And at our preserve, we see in a good year, the Humboldt lily, which will, it could be as tall as me. I'm not very tall, but it could be as tall as me. And it has these beautiful flowers. Um, we also have poison oak in the oak woodlands. It's not an oak at all. Toxicodendron. And if you touch it, you get the terrible itches. So when the Irish visitors come, we have to teach them poison oak or they'll be suffering for their whole vacation. Um, oaks, a lot of our volunteers go, Sally, Sally, tell me where the female oak flowers are. And these are little tiny female flowers. They're very hard to find. And here are the male catkins, which are easier. Um, another plant community or habitat type is the chaparral. It's, it's very characteristically Californian, really. We call it the California elfin forest. It's very tough and dry place, rocky. The plants, the shrubs, a lot of different shrubs put their roots way down in among the rocks to, to find moisture. And um, we'll look at a few of these. Here is Ceanothus or California lilac. We have many, many species. And I know in Irish gardens, some of these are even cultivated. Funny thing I teach our volunteers is when the seed pots fall off, you have these places left over. And uh, the way to know a Ceanothus is to find these. And they look either like a peace symbol or a Mercedes symbol, depending on who you are. So there, I threw in some animals. So here's a Ceanothus silk moth that feeds on the Ceanothus leaves. And here's its caterpillar. The moth is much more beautiful than the caterpillar, I think. Um, other plants of the chaparral, all very drought tolerant, are the chaparral pea and the pitcher sage. And we have vines, clematis in Europe, um, clematis or clematis. They're a cultivated species that they grow up houses. They climb up beautiful old stone houses. And the, the fruits look like this. And they have feathery, feathery fruits. Oh, this slide's a bit weird looking, but anyway, manzanita with bell-like flowers. This is in the heather family. And the yucca is, is a beautiful moth-pollinated chaparral plant. Nasty, you don't want to fall into one of these. The Native Americans used the fibers from these to, to weave and make ropes and things like that. Lemonade berry, um, Rus integrifolia. You can lick those berries and they taste just like lemon. Um, another couple, we have a wild cherry, the holly leaf cherry, and flannel bush that's often grown in gardens. It's very, very beautiful. Oh, monkey flower. And if you 
it has a two-parted stigma. You get a little piece of grass and tickle the stigma, it'll close. And we think that's like mimicking an insect bringing pollen. It'll eventually open up again. Here's another sage, the purple sage. And this is what often happens, unfortunately. And you've all seen this on the TV and we're all getting worried about fire again. This is a huge fire that burned in 2007. It forms these clouds called pyrocumulus clouds and the clouds rise up and then they fall down again. And sometimes these fires even create their own rain. Um, here's the kind of activity. This was just over the hill from my house, unfortunately. Um, they're going to a local pond, picking up water and then dropping it on the fire. Here's what it looks like after a fire. Here's what, and, and we think, oh, well, there's nothing, no plants, it's all dead. But pretty soon, some of these shrubs are going to sprout and very soon you get beautiful wildflowers. And, and the plants are adapted in different ways. Some of them sprout from the root crown area from a big burl, and some are killed entirely, but those species regenerate from seed. And some of these seeds actually need chemicals from the ash to make them sprout. This is the kind of thing we see after a fire. Amazing, beautiful. This was actually not in our county. This was down Santa Monica Mountains, I think. See all this dead landscape suddenly comes back to life. And then uh, this was on the Gaviota Coast nearby. It's actually a land trust um, conservation easement on that property. Here we have Mariposa lilies, and these are called blue dicks, Dicolostema. It's a lily sort of relative, another one. Um, we have special flowers that come up only after fires, and this is the large flowered Facelia, and this is the nettle or stinging lupin that has kind of stinging hairs. And here is whispering bells, it's not a good picture, and the fire poppy. I actually haven't seen too many of these, but they come up after fires. And after a couple of years, you get other plants, shrubs starting to bloom. And this is a sticky snapdragon. My granny used to talk about antirhinums in her garden, and that's an antirhinum. Um, woolly blue curls is a real beauty that you see in areas that were burned a few years ago. Very, very beautiful. It's hard to grow in a garden, but you can. Here are the mariposa lilies again. And as I said before, we have um, a lot of plants that, that have many, many species and mariposa lilies, um, these are such plants. And there's a woman we know named Jeanette Sines who just came out with a book on the genus Calicordus or the mariposa lilies. And I'm desperate to get one, It'd be beautiful. Here are some yellow ones. Other ones, some of these were from, um, these ones were on a burned area. And here are some more. This one actually grows on the Rio Hondo where I work. And this is from the desert. There's some more, very pretty. Um, another plant that we find, I don't have flowers to show you here, but this is the wild cucumber or the man root. And this often springs up right after a fire and, and just wanders. It's a vine that wanders all over the burned area. And the reason is it has this huge structure underneath the ground that contains a lot of stored starch. And so it doesn't take much to feed a whole new huge vine. So you see these big green areas very quickly. The girl is there for scale. Um, and then a bird, this is the California thrasher. It's a bird that, um, it's, it's a mimicking bird. It makes a lot of different sounds and they talk about it singing the song of the chaparral. Um, riparian or streamside habitats, here we have some and they're very special because 
not only do they support a lot of interesting plants, they are a lifeline for all of our animals, especially in the dry season. And here are a couple of different monkey flowers that grow in damp places, Mimulus or mm, Diplicus, I'm not sure which genus it is now, the names keep changing. Um, giant stream orchids, they're not really giants at all, but they're beautiful. They're giants because most of our native orchids are tiny. Cattails and horsetails, these are plants of damp areas too. And willows, the volunteers, I, I teach them, okay, you've got to learn a male willow produces pollen. A whole tree is a male, a whole tree is a female. Here's a female. Um, grassland habitats, we have a lot of around here. Our grasslands are sort of spoiled because most of the grasslands have many, many European and other non-native grasses but they still support a lot of beautiful native wildflowers. And this is, the pink is owl's clover. And often you'll see the hills that look painted with pink. Here's owl's clover and, and a relative, the Indian paintbrush. Both of these are um, partial parasites. So they are attached to the roots of other plants and get part of, part of their nutrition actually from the other plants. They are green though, so they make some of their own food. California poppies are famous. And then we have another poppy in the grasslands and on hillsides that looks like a California poppy, but if you turn the flower over, you'll discover some differences. These are called the tufted poppies. They're very beautiful. Um, another poppy is the cream cup, a different genus. Platystemon, and they can come in white and yellow depending on where you are. They have nodding buds like a lot of cultivated poppies. Um, sunflowers, we have a lot of different species of sunflowers. It's a huge, um, hugely important plant family in California. These attract butterflies and, and a lot of insects. This Cliff Smith called Golden Girls, Kinactus, and this is tidy tips, Leia. You can see the tidy tips. And just in case you didn't know, a sunflower is not a flower at all. It's a head of flowers. And I took this one apart. These are the ray flowers. That, that's actually a flower. And each of these little ones, which will result in the so-called sunflower seed, which is actually a one seeded fruit. Those are called the disc flowers. Um, baby blue eyes, here's another beauty. Shady grassland spots and on damp banks, you see this gorgeous color. And buttercups, this is our California buttercup. Very pretty. And red maids, but they're not red at all, they're pink. They come up very early with the buttercups in the grasslands. And Johnny jump ups. It's a little viola, a little violet. And then towards the end of the season, right now when I go out in the grasslands, I'm finding these things. These are called golden stars. They're lilies that uh, form a bulb and then they put up a big stalk with these beautiful little lilies. And this one is, is a brodea. It's also related to lilies. And you don't notice these because they're very low, low down. You have to kind of look for them among the grasses. Oh, then a rainbow. Um, now I'm going to show you some places that I like to go. And if any of you Irish people come over, we'll go hunting in these places if you come at the right time of year. And if, if not, maybe we'll go on. Um, some of the local people can come along on our wildflower, not wildflower, our um, land trust treks, and we might time some for a good wildflower season. So this, this is a local area called Drum Canyon. And actually a lot of local people have never driven through this canyon. It's between Buellton and Los Alamos. It's a beautiful drive. And you see things like this. This is the tufted poppy. 
And this is the sticky phacelia, very beautiful. Something to notice here, and you can look at some of the other flowers as we go along. These, if you're an insect and you come up to this, here's a huge target. It's a big target you're going flying along and you see this target and you zoom in and then you pick up some pollen. And the targets aren't just round, they have spots, lots of markings. Um, here are some other, these are called Clarkias and some of them are known as farewell to spring because they come up when the grasses are, are well, when the, the soil is drying out. There's a famous area, Figueroa Mountain. And this is a picture that you might see from the freeway that goes up the state. You, if the sun is out and there are poppies, the mountain peak, this is Grass Mountain, it looks orange. When the sun goes behind the clouds or the evening comes, it becomes green because the poppies close at night and when it's not sunny. Oh, if you go there, you might see a golden eagle. So look out for those guys. Um, and on Figueroa, we have lots and lots. It's a mountain that goes up. The road goes very high and it goes up several thousand feet. And there's a huge diversity of wildflowers in the Goodyear. Here's a wild delphinium. Here's a wild allium or onion. And here is something we call Chinese houses because it has well, a little pagoda arrangement. Um, and then here's, a, here's an interesting one called Linanthus. It's in the flock. I think it's still in the flocks family. They keep changing things, so I can't keep up. But this has a variety of different colors of flowers, white, pink, blue. Very interesting. Again, here you see some of these little targets. We talk about nectar guides guiding the insect or the other pollinator towards the, the um, nectar. And here, here the genus Gilia has blue pollen. I think those are really pretty. This is a tiny flower, but you can see the blue pollen. And here's a poisonous plant, the chaparral zygodene, also called the death camas or the star lily. It's very pretty. And chia sage, some of us over here know about chia. It was very important um, to the, our local Shumash people. And some of the burials contain um, little containers or baskets full of chia seeds as sort of perhaps an offering, I'm not sure. And here's something called blue-eyed grass. It's not a grass at all, but doesn't have a blue eye either. It has a yellow eye. Um, here's a bush poppy. And here's, is Bonnie there? If Bonnie's there, that's Bonnie. I thought I saw her name. And Bonnie and I and another friend, we were up in the mountains, up on Figaro, and she was taking lots of pictures as I was. Um, lupins, we have lots and lots of types of lupins, uh, lots of species. Here are some more. And this one, you can see it has tiny dots. And those are, we could also call those nectar guides because they may be guiding the bee in towards the, well, the plant would be trying to get the pot. Well, plants don't try, but would be bringing the insect in and then the insect would go off with some pollen. And then some lupins, when the flowers are fading, they turn reddish. And we know that a lot of insects can't really see in the red part of the spectrum. And so this is sort of saying, go away, go to the next flower. These flowers are no longer interesting, probably because they've either been pollinated or they're too far gone. Oh, here's one of the things that people go up to Figaro Mountain for. And I've met tourists up there that say, where are the chocolate lilies? I don't even know what they look like, but I was told to come up and see the chocolate lilies. And here they are, they're, they're brown and sometimes greener. They're really beautiful, they're kind of shiny. I don't like plastic, but they almost look like plastic flowers. Um, 
Colson Canyon, I put this in because there's a rare relative of the chocolate lily in Colson Canyon. This is called the checker lily. And the checker lily also has really interesting nectar guides. Very pretty. It's hard to find. Um, here's where we work, where I work. Um, and it's a beautiful place. It has many different habitat types. It has flower. We can find flowers from February through November, I'd say, and abundant wildlife. We keep it closed a lot of the time, but when it's open, the visitors can come and look for plants and wildlife. We keep it closed to protect the wildlife, really. Um, here's a painting. A friend of mine sent me a picture of this. She said, my he said, my mother used to have this on her table. And I'd never seen this picture, so I, I made a photograph of it, uh, of his photograph, actually. <laughs> Beautiful. She's a famous artist of the Oak Group, who is no longer with us, but this is her beautiful picture. Arroyo Hondo, this preserve has a, a stream which is running almost all of the year, but in dry summers like this one will be, it'll be dried up in places, but we'll still have pools. And our Department of um, Fish and Wildlife biologists come up and they actually move the rainbow trout and or steelhead into the deeper pools where there's more oxygen in the summer. Here's a, one of our rare species. We have a lot of rare species there, and this is the red-legged frog. It's hard to find these in the daylight, but I was lucky. Um, here's a giant stream orchid close up. We have those. We also have beautiful California wild roses, and this has been a really good year for the wild rose. They're very, very fragrant. And the scarlet larkspur. Delphinium cardinalis, like the cardinal, the cardinal bird. They're very gorgeous and they attract hummingbirds too. Um, we have a rare fern, the Sonoran maiden fern, and that's mentioned in the flora of the Santa Barbara region with a location of Arroyo Hondo Preserve. It's not a flowering plant, obviously. Greenbark ceanothus is one of two species that are common at the preserve, and these bloom really early. The white flowered species blooms first, and then the blue. Um, chaparral plants, you've seen pictures of these before, but here's the pitcher sage, the monkey flower, and the sticky snapdragon. And then we have a succulent. You can't really see the succulent leaves here, but this is one of our many species in California of Dudleya. And here are the flowers. Um, and we have deer, lots of deer actually. The deer are not showing themselves lately. So we think a mountain lion has come down the canyon and chased them all up higher, but they'll be back. I also think one of the game cameras saw a baby fawn. So maybe the does are hiding their babies. Um, this is a beautiful area. I better check the time here. Hmm, still have time. The Cuyama Valley is out to the east. Um, it's not as far as the Criso Plain, but it is verging on semi-desert. And this is a very good wildflower year. We have a, a huge mass of different species, owls, clover, fiddle neck, all kinds of things. It's a place people go to see the flowers in a good year. Here's a, a special famous canyon, Cottonwood Canyon out there. So in this, this wash area, we find all kinds of species of wildflowers. Early in the year, it's a fuzzy picture, but those are shooting stars in the Primula family. Very pretty. And here's my friend Lori. Um, and Lori is posing beside hillside daisies. Now, if we were on the coast with that fuzzy picture, you'd think we were adoring mustard, which we actually hate because the mustard's from Europe and it's a weed. But these are native daisies. Foothill Daisy. Um, here's another view of the Cuyama Valley, beautiful in spring. 
And here, here's an amazing thing called thistle sage. And where the, one, the little flower I showed you before had blue pollen, this one has orange red pollen. Here's an odd one, they're not usually pink. Here's the chrysoplane, this, this big um, inland grassland, and this is called the Caliente Range. And the Caliente Range also has wildflower displays, but it's hard to get up in there. But see, these are, these different colors are different species of sun, wild sunflowers. Lots of different plants in there. You can't really tell that. Here's another Carissa Plain picture in a different year. And from year to year, the color patterns vary. And you see artists out there with umbrellas and they're painting and you see um, just different patterns. Oh, and we have rare animals out there. We went out there with a, a biologist and he was very interested in these San Joaquin antelope ground squirrels. And he even knew how to talk them out of their burrows. And he made this little noise and the kids came out and after, these are young ones. And after a while, the mother came up and disciplined them and made them go right back down. It was pretty funny. Uh, here's more Carissa Plain. This is a San Joaquin Valley Facilia. And here are more different daisies. And here, um, some of you may remember or know, have known this man. He was one of our special botany people. He wrote the flora of the Santa Barbara region. And here he is. This is the back of his book. I took a picture of the cover with these weird plants called desert candles. And here is a desert candle that I took a picture of. Um, and another very special person um, was Dr. Bob Haller, who was an inspirational um, botany professor at UC Santa Barbara. And many of the people who are just about to retire from being botany professors in California and the rest of the West were his students. He inspired so many people. He loved the Carrizo Plain. And oh, pronghorns. The pronghorn has been released again onto the Carrizo Plain. And that's actually taken somewhere else, but I stuck in a, a pronghorn for fun. Um, here's in the middle of the plain, there's this uh, alkali sink lake called Soda Lake. And it only fills up in a wet year. And in those years, it it attracts a lot of migratory waterfowl, including the American avocet, beautiful bird. Um, and along the sides of the lake, there's a rare larkspur. They've even built a little boardwalk so you can go along and see this without smashing them with your feet. A beautiful larkspur, the recurved larkspur. And then, oh, I just have one picture, another up at the top of the Crisa Plain, you drive up this long day drive, you turn left and after many miles, you'll come to Shell Creek, which is a, a area on a private ranch that the owner who has a conservation easement actually with the range, the California Rangeland Trust, he allows the public to come in and take pictures of his wildflowers. He just basically has it open for the wildflower season very generously. Oh, Steve Junak will be there. And if he had pictures of the Channel Islands, he would do a much better job. I only put in a couple, but if you ever want to go to the Channel Islands and learn about the plants, sign up through the Botanic Garden uh, for a trip that Steve Junak is leading. He is our foremost Channel Islands botanist. I think this pier no longer exists, but um, anyway, here's, I only have a couple of plants, the Northern Island tree mallow and the Island monkey flower. There are a lot of endemic species that grow on our channel islands, meaning they don't grow anywhere else. Here's giant Coreopsis. This grows, it's a funny kind of succulent shrub that flowers in March and, here the seagulls are nesting. It's not a good picture, but at least 
there. If you go to Anacapa Island, you'll see this plant. And then close by to where I live, Halama Beach, uh, has beautiful spring displays on the bluffs too. And then, oh, this is a place that we hope to lead a, a trek to soon when the state parks will allow us to have groups again because of COVID waning. Um, Oso Flaco is up north of Santa Barbara by a little town called Guadalupe. It, it has freshwater lakes in the sand dunes, very interesting. Many habitats in a short walk. We have this cool honeysuckle, the twinberry honeysuckle. Here we have two flowers together in an involucre. And this is how the fruit looks. We have two berries with the same thing. Very colorful, very pretty. Grows in moist places. And then I had to put in a couple of um, cinnamon teal. Cinnamon teal are beautiful migratory ducks. And in the winter, you can go up there and you might see eight different species of migratory ducks and white pelicans and um, all kinds of different interesting birds. Here's something that some people look for a long time for and don't find. This is the Sora. And the Sora is walking around underneath the tulis at Oso Flaco. Beautiful plants. This is a silver beech lupin that big, big shrubs over the sand on the stabilized part of the sand dunes. And then on the shifting sand, we have a lot of other plants like the beach primrose, which straggles along and, and seems to be able to hold the sand. And here's sand verbena. There are actually, I think there are three species up there, but I just had pictures of two. Same thing, they straggle along and seem to be holding the sand. Oh, I guess I changed my tune here and I'm going back to Think about pollination. And here is a hummingbird. I think it's an Anna's hummingbird. I've seen this picture before, but it's very well adapted to um, obtaining nectar from these flowers. Here are some others. This is a Rufus hummingbird that I met last year. And it was also attracted to the hummingbird sage. Beautiful, shining little thing. People call these the jewels of the air because they shine in the sun. Um, and, and hummingbirds like humans can see red. Many insects can't. So a lot of these red tubular flowers are of no interest to, to insects. Um, it's almost my analogy would be, you know, the difference between a black and white newspaper and a colored magazine. These look like a black and white newspaper to insects where they look like a colored magazine to the hummingbirds. And um, here are some more hummingbird plants. And they say that in Santa Barbara County, we have some, at least one species of hummingbird attracting plant in bloom almost for the whole year. I mean, we have some that are early. This is this one's early, this one's late, um, but lo lots of interest for the hummingbirds. And then I learned that in the winter, sometimes hummingbirds follow sap suckers, which are drilling into trees to obtain sap. So if there's no nectar, they may actually be feeding on sap from, from just cheating on the sap suckers, stealing their sap sort of funny. Anyway, another thing, um, interesting butterfly, the monarch butterfly is known to be, to make birds sick. They've done experiments with caged birds and the birds that eat monarch butterflies get act really sick. And the reason is because the caterpillars eat milkweeds and the milkweeds contain toxins and the, the butterflies retain the toxin. And we know that animals that are orange are, are warning predators that perhaps they're toxic. They're, they're even, not intentionally, but through evolution, um, these 
butterflies, they're actually butterflies that are called mimics and they mimic the color of the monarchs and birds avoid them because they think they're going to get sick, I guess. It's a learning thing. They did experiments with caged birds and, and they could see that the birds changed their tune once they had tasted a monarch butterfly. Here's some, we have lots of beautiful butterflies in California and this, this one of my favorites is the checker spot. You can see the, the top of the wings have a completely different pattern from the underneath. This poor butterfly is trapped in a cobweb, but this one is visiting a purple sage. And yuccas, I don't have moths attached to these pictures, but yuccas are pollinated by moths. And here's a moth, a sphinx moth that we see around here. Some people call them hummingbird moths. Must be getting, oh. I, and then I thought we could think about seed dispersal. Um, so we teach our volunteers to think about, you know, who would visit it and take a, a cherry from the holly leaf cherry and probably a bird or a mammal. And we actually find scat or droppings from coyotes and bears that contain the seeds of the holly leaf cherry. And then these cockle burrs, what do you think? They have, it's hard to see, but they have tiny little hooks. And these are carried around by animals. And then these silky ones are milkweed seeds and they blow in the wind. And then of course, there's the wind in the willows. And the willows, these little, the female willows produce lots of little fluffy seeds. And on a windy day, they'll float off in the air and perhaps some will land in the damp spot and germinate. So how is my time? Okay, so this is really the second last slide and I am hoping for plentiful rain next winter and I will always be searching for wildflowers and I hope you do too. <laughs>